Okay, everyone, welcome to the last talk session for the day. This is a series of success stories with Galaxy or a series of speakers being surprised when the bell rings earlier than they thought. <laughs> we'll see how we go. I think we've got it sorted now. Um, we might get cracking because we've got a, a series of short talks and a couple of long talks. Um, as I said, success stories with Galaxy. Dan from the Cleveland Clinic Clinic's going to talk to us a bit about uh, what is it? Metagenomics. Over to you, Dan. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning or afternoon, I guess, everyone. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk that was originally supposed to be given by uh, Fabio Kumbo, but um, he unfortunately had some visa issues, so he wasn't able to come. But I get to go tell you about all this great work that he's been doing. Um, so when I say we, I very much mean a lot of this work has primarily been done by, by Fabio. So um, first, I want to quickly just uh, give a brief introduction to sort of uh, what the microbiome is. Um, so as you're aware, we have um, many, many cells within your own body, but there's actually a larger number of microorganisms that live with inside, of you, inside of your own body um, that have large influences um, across um, metabolism, um, you know, the, the gut access, uh, brain gut access, um, and so forth. And so um, it's important to realize that um, these microorganisms that are living inside of you have a large impact on your health, um, the, the uh, compounds that they're generating, the metabolites, um, they, they really have a large influence within um, your, own, your own body, your own human health. Um, and then so what can we do to sort of um, investigate um, these, these uh, microorganisms and, and sort of better characterize them? So um, I want to talk today about something called meta-SBT. Um, and so metagenomics um, allows us to study not only well-characterized uh, microbes, but also a large number of uh, microorganisms that are not able to be cultured. Um, there, there's also um, an increasingly large collection of meta-genome uh, assembled genomes, also known as MAGs. Um, and these have sort of um, paved the way to get from, um, you know, higher order of um, taxonomies into individual uh, species and including strain level resolution um, of these microorganisms. And it's important to get down to these, uh, the, these more precise um, categories um, because you know, it, it's really not just what microorganism is there, but it's the, the, the genes that they have that, that are actually acting uh, within your body with creating, um, you know, the, these um, compounds and metabolites and affecting your, your human health. And so what, what we're really missing now is a systematic procedure um, for organizing and processing hundreds to, to hundreds of thousands of these mags along with all of these reference genomes that have been obtained from doing isolate sequencing. Um, and, and then how can we uh, then further go ahead and uh, leverage um, these along with human health metadata, for example, to, to um, determine how we can assess and improve human health. So what is uh, MetaSBT? This is a computational framework um, composed of several different modules, uh, different subroutines. Um, and so if we want to first uh, think about the, the first one, this is the meta-SPT index. Uh, and so what we can do is we can take a, a collection of genomes along with their taxonomies, and we can build um, um, uh, sequence bloom trees for these in order to allow us um, to uh, create a database that we can then take with our own um, sequencing data, our own uh, mags that we've assembled, for example, to then go ahead and investigate this. So MetaSBT, it leverages a tool called HowdySBT, um, which is uh, written by uh, Bob Harris um, from, from Penn State. Um, and it's greatly improved upon from um, the, the Kingsford and Salomon 2016 approach for, for building uh, these sequence bloom trees. 
Um, it also uh, includes check M to uh, build with uh, completeness, contamination, and so forth. So the, the index allows us to build the database. There's a boundaries uh, function that then allows us to determine the, the common camers, the minimum and maximum of those, as well as the camers between these different um, taxonomic levels. And so when we're actually building these, we're building seven different um, uh, SPTs um, from the, the different taxonomic levels from species all the way up through to the kingdom. And the reason this is important that we do this, oh, the screen went blank. Um, the reason this is important that we do this is because we will want to end up having an update process. So with the profiling, what we can then do is we can provide our own sequence data, uh, plug it into here, and we can find out where along this taxonomic tree that our data uh, resolves. Yeah. And so one of the big problems with the currently existing processes is that there's no way to update, um, but because we're actually building um, different sets of trees at different levels with um, Meta SPT, um, we can actually have a update process where we can just update individual um, leaves across the tree without having to update the entire database. And this is important as we discover or sequence additional, uh, additional uh, metagenomics mags and, and, and fully assembled genomes. So, so far, uh, what Fabio has been able to do is he's indexed all of the viral reference genomes, as well as a large set of mags from uh, NCBI. Um, we're going to be expanding these with even more mags, uh, and as well as building uh, bacteria, archaea, and fungi species into this. Um, and we're currently investigating how to simplify this by building sketches um, representations of the genomes for these larger genomes, because some of these, pro some of these uh, clustering steps and so forth are quite computationally intensive. There is a, a Galaxy tool suite to do this, to build the, the indexes, the, the databases, to actually run profiling, and then also to update. Um, we're also, uh, we have the genomes available, the, the, the databases available. Uh, we'll be making them available on uh, CVMFS as well. Um, so that everyone will be able to use them within Galaxy or, or outside. Um, I, I'm almost out of time, but I also just want to briefly mention that, um, okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so if, if you want to go ahead and access these uh, databases and the tools, they're all open source, they're available uh, on GitHub, uh, they're available on Bioconda, uh, there are Galaxy tools that are also being released soon. So, thank you. And next up, we don't have time for questions at the moment, but uh, next up, we've got a, a talk from Linnell and Alex about uh, vertebrate genome project workflows within Galaxy. So I'm Linnell and this is Alex and we're here to give an update about a vertebrate genomes project and the Galaxy workflows we've been using to assemble a whole bunch of verb genomes. So the verb genomes project as a bit of an introduction is a bit of a lofty goal of a project where we're aiming to sequence as it says in the tin, all 66,000 vertebrate species, but baby steps. So we are chopping it up into phases. The first one of which is just sequencing a taxonomic representative from all orders, all vertebrate orders. And that amounts to about 260 species of which we are almost finished. We have a little over 200 sequenced in NCBI and um, curated in NCBI ready for annotation. And on our, we have all of them publicly available as well. This table is just a screenshot from our public facing portal where all of the data is publicly accessible and viewable as long as you adhere to our data usage policies which you can email Eric about and not me. And aside from that, so these are the 51 genomes that have been done so far. Well, more since this, the 51 that are, have been done and described in the paper that just came out and is on BioArchive. It is currently in submission at Nature Biotech, yay. But so it's 51 species assembled across the vertebrate tree of life. That's sharks, fish, mammals, reptiles, birds, and it even works on some invertebrates. We've, we use it on some spiders and some mosquitoes because people don't, 
read the lab name, but um, it works on a variety of genome complexity too, from very homozygous, um, critically endangered zoo species from zoo populations to very heterozygous, almost like strain crosses of zebra finches in a colony. Also genome size, it has worked on the 800, gig, the 800 megabase pair chub mackerel all the way to the eight gigabase pair corroboree frog, which crashed every single node I tried to run it on. And about a third to half of these were run on Galaxy EU using freely available public compute because it was before I was able to set up our local server and um, really utilize the uh, compute my institution has and also stop giving Bjorn a headache. But um, the actual workflow itself is dependent on HiFi data uh, to make contacts using HiFi ASM. And we have a variety of different workflows available for if you have additional phasing data like trio parental data or high C data, which you can also use later on for scaffolding. And also there's scaffolding pipeline for BioNano. And there's also expert workflows that help get all of your um, reference quality genomes up and out into our genome arc where they are also freely publicly accessible. There's also an independently invoked mito, uh, sem mito genome assembly pipeline that's available as a workflow too. And yeah, so the progress updates were, as I mentioned, paper has been submitted to Nature Biotech, also in BioArchive if you want to take a look at it. And it's 51 plus genomes assembled and available, and they're directly available from the data importer on major servers. You can just click Genomark and just navigate to your species you want. And there's more genomes that have been done since this was updated, but I'll take it. And I give the update on the actual enhancements to Galaxy that we've made uh, for this. So all of the workflows that are being used by the VGP are now available on DocStore. So you can pull them into a Galaxy instance very easily and run them if all of the tools are available on your instance. Um, they're also all available from, uh, from the VGP page on DocStore, like I mentioned. Um, everything is currently runnable on both org and EU and hoping to get it available on the Australian server soon. We also have extensive training material available through the GTN, which will allow you to assemble your own genomes as well as to assemble any with uh, the, the, any data that is available in GenomeArc, because again, that is available from the importer now. Uh, in the future, we're looking to obviously do some more genomes to increase pace by running it against multiple servers, um, as well as the VGL's compute, um, increase automation uh, and just more places are running it. And as people become more aware of, of the VGP, uh, they can start running their own and helping out the project themselves. We also want to be using some of the more, uh, some of the IWC enhancements. So for example, uh, alternative workflow paths, such uh, so that a workflow, depending on what data is available for any given species, you can run a different version of the workflow from a single invocation. More will be discussed about that in posters that Tyler and I will be uh, discussing later, as well as a talk on Wednesday. Uh, furthermore, we want to start uh, annotating the workflows that are being output, so we're going to have some workflows on that, as well as some availability on the Australian server. I uh, want to give a thanks to everybody who has helped out on this project, as well as some of our funders, and love to have some questions. Thank you. Wait, sorry, one more thing for the update. I forgot to mention, very importantly, related to the genome sequencing hubs, we've got some buy-in from local projects such as the Sidra HPC and I believe Qatar, which has set up a Galaxy instance to sequence um, species natives there and culturally important there. And African Biogenome Project, I'm also helping them set up their local instance, which I think the compute is located in Johannesburg, but I could be wrong. That's a fun update. So you said a lot of this was run on public uh, infrastructure. So um, approximately how much did you save um, by giving Bjorn a headache versus using AWS? Um, you mean like using money? If you had to pay uh, for that compute, AWS, or? if you had to pay for the compute with AWS, right? How much, how much, how much money did, did I save? save? Yeah. Um, I haven't run the numbers and I don't think I will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good question. It is in the metrics. I could tally it up on the metrics according to EU, but um, I won't. <laughs> Probably still worth Bjorn's headache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's in the metrics. I just not counting where I was troubleshooting some of the stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, there's, there's, we got enough time for one question. I will do a shout out to Anna Syme is going to wave at the back. 
you two should talk to Anna Syme about getting the VGP pipelines onto Galaxy AU because Anna's already started that work. All right, time for a 30 second question. What's the uh, annotation workflow going to do and uh, how heavy is it in compute? I don't know. <laughs> I am new to genome annotation, so we'll be deferring to like Anthony and a couple other experts for that because we have been usually just waiting for NCBI to annotate it once we get our RNA-seq and ISO-seq data uploaded. But it would be nice to have also like a quick and dirty annotation of just like maybe repeat content of the finished assemblies. But um, to be determined and if you want to help make that happen. And Remember. also, um, what about the transcriptome? Like, is that something that will also be done? Like or? a separate transcriptomic assembly workload? I don't know. We don't, I don't know if we generate enough data for that usually as part of ours. So. Sorry. And really quick plug before we walk away, we have a post. We didn't really get to get into actually the nitty gritty of the pipeline. So if you want to talk to us about that, we have a poster on Wednesday and you can come to the VGP training on Thursday. Let me start with Thank again, thank you for organizers for getting us there. It's a great opportunity to see the great country. But oh my gosh, to get here. I arrived today at 5 a.m. after 26 hours trip. So if I fall asleep, don't blame me, please. I'll try to do it quickly. So that's a short slide for motivation and introduction. So basically we have this great compute resources in our lab, compute, supercomputer number one in the world, supercomputer number five in the world. We have great experimental facilities, great scientists, but the, the part which is missing is the one that glues all this stuff together. That basically a lot of work has to be done manually. What we felt this morning also that the domain scientists don't want probably maybe to focus on infrastructure, on copying data on starting stuff, they want to concentrate on, on their work. So that's why we started looking into Galaxy. We we're lucky that we found Galaxy, basically our job, what we had been doing since a year or so is adjusting Galaxy, or part of the work is adjusting Galaxy to our infrastructure. Theoretically, if you read tutorials, whatever, Galaxy can run everywhere, laptop, cloud, HPC, Kubernetes. That's true, but still, to make it work, some, some efforts are required, and we've been doing it. We have multiple resources which are available for our users. It's experimental analysis clusters, some cloud machines, HPC in cloud, we have HDGX nodes, and we have these two big machines, Summit and Frontier. So I split it into three parts, what, we, what has to be done. Basically, we have to, to make sure that we can use this multi-cluster, multiple computer resources. So we have the set HPC, cluster, cloud, whatever. But this all kind of multiple isolated islands of computer resources. And what we want to do to make it transparent for Galaxy users. Then you have this authentication authorization problem. In the same, you have different islands with different security requirements. On HPC, it should be two-factor authentication. On cloud, it should be some other authentication. On this cluster, we can have external users. We can have internal users. And yeah, our idea, our goal, again, to make it transparent for Galaxy users so that it use Galaxy and don't care about authentication. And also requiring that the job should run on behalf of the user. We cannot just have some service account that runs Galaxy jobs because of the accounting of the data access and so on. And the short part may be probably the most complicated one. So we, again, we have multiple islands of storage, multiple islands of data. We have data in HPC, we have data coming from experiment, we have data stored in the cloud. You have different even access modes to this data. There's all open data, there's some moderated data. And again, we want that to be also transparent for the Galaxy user. And here the condition is that we don't want to basically, we cannot duplicate data because experiment produces petabytes of data and we cannot just create another object store in Galaxy and copy data there. So Galaxy ideally should stay in place. So how we implemented all these computers was relatively easy. 
Thanks for Galaxy, we have Pulsar, Galaxy, Rabbit and Q and combination of these three basically did the work for us. We have the different islands and we start Pulsar on the islands and then Galaxy send jobs to Pulsar for Rabbit and Q. Rabbit and Q was very useful for the to changing direction of the flows to deal with firewalls. On how access summit, we have this Kubernetes cluster, which is basically, you can start a port on this cluster and this cluster has connection to summit and can submit jobs to summit. So we also start Pulsar and Kubernetes and then it can accept jobs from Galaxy. That's easy, modes. With more difficult authentication, authorization, what we did, we're using OBC tokens that was also already available in Galaxy. We don't have the Galaxy user like in database. We use a central identity provider and the Galaxy user can log in for this provider and then we receive the open ID token. And we start passing this token to all resources where we run Galaxy jobs and using this token, using different authorization mechanism, we allow or not allow to start the job, allow or disallow access to the data. For this, we had to do some changes to Galaxy and Pulsar. First one was the, to auto refresh this token because previously when you received this token, when you log into Galaxy, you get this token, it was stored in database, you basically never updated there. So now we do this auto refresh and we expose this token as a Galaxy endpoint for Pulsar so that the job running and for Pulsar could then get this token, this fresh token from Galaxy and use it. Also we implemented an option to run Docker container as a user because currently you can hard code and configuration a user to run Docker container, but we want to be dynamically. So we also use this token, we extract, have these parameters for the destination and you can extract them and then check the token and run this Docker container as a user. Also created a couple Pulsar plugins to authenticate authorized job on a user base. So currently Pulsar does not know actually which user submitted the job, it just can check the tool if the tool for the destination are here or not, okay. but we also implemented, they can have a look into the token again, extract the username and then using different plugins decide if this user allowed to run the jobs or not. This briefly about authorization, data management. Just a reminder what we have, what we want to do. So again, Galaxy has this object store. You can use the object store and we use it and we use it to put data and get data from Galaxy and we also use it from Pulsar side to get data from object store before you submit the job and put out put data set back. I'm saying here put and get instead of upload download because it's that we don't want to move data or it's not necessary so in some cases we just keep data in place and just work with metadata. So this Galaxy object store should be able to work with these different islands of data and how we implemented it. We are using Rusio plugin. Rusio is a distributed management, data management solution coming from CERN where they use it to store data in different tiers around the globe. And we created this Rusio plugin for Galaxy object store. So basically Galaxy only talks to Rusio plugin using this couple of functions and then a Russo is configured to talk with different islands of data. A bit more about implementation. So basically for Russo, you have to configure this Russo storage element and for different, for all of this data uh, storage resources for HPC, for example, cloud and experiments in this page, in this slide. And then you can configure different protocols which this storage element can use to deliver, to upload, download basically data. And then depending on the location where you want, where you run, where you executing this request from, you can use different protocols to get this data. So basically if you're on the pool side that run on HPC, for example, you ask Russo to download file Russo 
as an answer, just give use protocol some some protocol. It could be POSIX, it could be S3, it could be, it's also, everything is configurable. So as Carus, I want to download file with a use protocol. And then you go to the storage and using this protocol, you get your data. And one of the protocol could be the sim link where you really don't copy data and just, if your, your job is located close to the data storage, then you don't have to move the data and the protocol which Russia would give you, allows you not to moving the data, just to get a sim link or simple copy, whatever. But if you're somewhere away from the storage, if you are in cloud and want to get data from HPC, then the Russia would return on some different protocol, sim link would not work. It will give you as free or custom protocol to get this data. Notarization authentication also working with these tokens. Also what we implement, as I said, this in place in jest, we don't want to download, we don't want to move the data. So we created a tool and this protocol and changed to Russo plugin. So you can just ingest the data to the Galaxy, to Russo, basically you. Galaxy says, I want to, Galaxy still executes this calls, this upload method, but then Russo know that it should not do upload or just ingest the metadata. Yeah, and the nice feature is that Galaxy still sees this data set as a normal one. You can click on an eye, you can see this data. It will be downloaded if the data is not close to Galaxy. But so as we said, for, for users that transparent and behind the scene that all this data movement happens or not happens. Some changes has to be done. First of all, this Russo plugin we created quite similar to IROTS and free plugins that are there, still has to be refactored because as I learned today, it will be refactor the other plugins. We have to refactor rules as well. Another feature that we had to use the set meta from Pulsar, not as a part of the job, because normally when you submit a job to Pulsar, then the job script, job runs, and at the end of the script, the job executes basically sending metadata and uploading file somewhere to object store. We did not, or we could not use it because the job can be executed on some summit node and we don't have control there. We cannot install Galaxy dependencies there. So we have to change it to introduce an option that after job has finished, Pulsar calls basically the same script to upload the data or ingest the data. Download from object store only when needed. Again, as it was implemented before, as soon as you touch this get file name function, the data has been downloaded from object store into this Galaxy cache. And we kind of split this two functionality. So until you click the I button, the Galaxy uh, data would never leave its original location. And in many cases, you don't need it. If you run workflow steps on different resources, you don't or on the same resource, then there is no data copy at all. If it's not different resources, then data will be copied between these resources, but it will not be copied, unnecessary copied to Galaxy and until you want to really see to download from your web client. Yeah, and a small one with displaying binary file instead of downloading. Some PRs are accepted, a couple, or one is pending and we still have to do a lot of them. <laughs> so that's basically the final architecture all together. We have Galaxy client, we authorize for identity provider, we send the job to RabbitMQ, to Pulsar, Pulsar talks to object store, gets the data, submit the job and push, push the data or register the data back. Work in progress. My ideas, what we recently implemented is live job output. That's what our users wanted. When you run some tool, you actually don't see the output until the tool has finished. And we implemented that you can have this live view in Galaxy, it's pretty nice. Interactive tools on remote resources that I discussed with Nate, it's already working, <laughs> but for us did not work. When we started for Pulsar, it starts interactive tool somewhere, but we don't get the feedback to Galaxy. This we have to see how that works. Generic tools for HPC jobs. Also, we had to 
do quite a lot of hard coding inside the tool itself to make it run on summit. We don't like it and we're discussing how to make it better. Another one, this workflow stop restart. I'm not really sure if we like it, but our user you know, sometimes ask for it. So they start the job. We have now this live job out, but then they see, oh, it's already finished or conversion good enough or something like this or not. And they want to stop it, but they want to kill and delete all data sets. So kind of start. And if it's workflow, maybe then restart the next step of the workflow using this result. It's kind of break this reproducibility, so that's why we don't really like it. But if considered as a kind of interactive part of the work while users still investigating, that might be a nice feature as well. And we owe a lot of PRs to main Galaxy repo. <laughs> we should be working on it, yeah. And we will do. That's basically it. Thank you for attention. And I have to mention that's only the first part tomorrow, Eric Watson will do the second part, basically how we use all of this, what I just described. Got, got time for one question up the back here. It's for the Zoom folks we need, yep. Uh, really, is it on? I mean, I'm, Amazing talk. Um, I remember you came last year and um, you were starting out and like you have a fantastic vision there. I think it's not a question. I mean, it's just, I mean, really, really, really good job. I do want to say like all the things you've listed, these are really solid changes. We should have done them already for other projects in the community. This is fantastic. Um, please, please do also open a list of things you, you want to see. But I have to say everything you said makes a whole lot of sense. The architecture is really good. Uh, let's do it. I mean, really, really happy how you've done this. Also, your contributions are amazing. Please keep going. I mean, really good. Thank you. Thank you. We do our best. <laughs> but I think that that's because we try to, to get a feedback from our user and we are lucky that we have several users and we work with them. We ask them permanently, what do you need? And they, they tell us. And they, we try to, but I agree. What I want to, what I want to say, we need to collaborate with you guys more because I learned that you did something that we were already doing, or maybe there's already some solution. We kind of invent the bicycle the second time, so we want to change it. But thank you, yeah. Thanks, okay. Up, thanks again. Um, up next, we've got uh, Nettie. I'm, I think I'm gonna use your, your nickname. He's gonna talk about gene polymorphism and the links to Parkinson's disease and how you've investigated that in Galaxy. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, this is great opportunity so I could extend this thanks to Galaxy for extending um, uh, this support to us the regular biological scientists who are a bit sometimes stuck uh, in the world of bioinformatics so um, well done guys I think the Galaxy is improving from yeah so every every year yeah it's better and better so i will definitely recommend my students use that more uh so uh i will probably talk a little bit completely different than what sergey was uh, talking so it could be closer to some hearts or further i'm not sure uh so um it's about uh, superoxide dismutase and how um the polymorphism in this uh, gene could impact uh, uh, basically certain um, diseases. In this case, uh, its main uh, focus is on Parkinson's disease. But just before I start, sorry, I, I have a tendency to talk too long. So it's seven minutes. I realize I will have to be... Um, I am, honestly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. Uh, so um, just to mention that uh, big thank you for a number of people that are enlisted here. My student Mia, she did majority of work and uh, there are other colleagues uh, involved in the project. So I'm just thanking them for all uh, support here. Uh, and uh, just uh, regarding now um, the impact of um, a certain genetic background on uh, Parkinson disease. So I don't know if you uh, watch Back to the Future, maybe anyone watched Back to the Future? So I did, yeah. Hence, maybe younger generation not, yeah. So majority people did actually. So if you know uh, Michael J. Fox, famous actor, 
he uh, got Parkinson's disease quite early, so that's uh, very unusual, and uh, it's um, uh, mostly impacting population who are above uh, 70, but there are some people who are impacted very uh, early, like Michael J. Fox, and uh, in the case of Parkinson's disease, uh, there are a number of uh, interesting things that I will try to make short, uh, just overview. If, if you don't know, many uh, of people impacted by Parkinson's disease are um, having a bit of shaking um, um, movement. Uh, they are having that uh, trap, so-called um, uh, like, uh, clinical picture. So rigidity, stiffness. Um, they are also having impairments uh, in voluntary uh, movement. So there are lots of involuntary movement uh, and uh, a bit of posture issue. So uh, I have even family uh, member being impacted. So it's for me close to my heart uh, working on this uh, uh, in this area. So uh, this is a little bit of um, overview because there are some certain molecular markers that are overlapping with dementia and uh, Parkinson. But because of time, I will not go further. There are some Lewis bodies um, uh, that are found to be present in certain people uh, with Parkinson. And um, regarding um, the development of the disease, it's a complex multiple um, factorial uh, disease because there are a number of factors that do um, have um, make a like impact on this uh, disease. We are today focusing on genetics, but just bear in mind that there are, of course, there are other factors like environmental exposure and even gut microbiome. So it was good really talk because there is a very synergy about uh, that microbiome and um, predisposition. So eat a lot of fibers, if I could say, <laughs> keep your gut healthy. Uh, so today we are focusing on genetics uh, and uh, just um, uh, superoxide dismutase is one of these uh, genes that are enlisted to be potentially important here. So uh, there are around um, five to 10%, they say now even more, um, people that with uh, genetic predisposition, which is very likely in the case of Michael J. Fox, actually, uh, as he developed that very early. Uh, so we will uh, focus on that aspect uh, regarding genetic polymorphism of superoxide dismutase and how this um, polymorphism um, increase actually oxidative stress and uh, has a um, um, very good uh, hypothetical uh, chance to, to develop, uh, to lead to development of Parkinson's disease. So that was um, the goal, um, just uh, uh, an overview quickly. And uh, what we did, we uh, applied uh, Galaxy tools. There are multiple other tools. I'm aware that we should extend our use of Galaxy even further. So we'll um, definitely uh, more now be inclined to use uh, Galaxy for even other um, databases and to access it. So um, the poster is tomorrow. So if you have a specific questions and if I miss something to say, please come tomorrow too. But uh, there was a uh, sequences that were retrieved from uh, databases and uh, they were then uh, filtered. Okay, very good. So anyway, so we use Galaxy. Uh, I will give you an overview here. So database were used um, to get sequences. Then we did a bit of filtering using um, certain tools um, uh, such as uh, SNP um, AFF. And uh, we then did all this um, process to get towards deleterious uh, variants. So it was a uh, yeah, long talk for seven minutes. So, but we ended up with seven um, uh, variants, uh, which uh, were selected through this uh, pipeline workflow. Um, and um, so I will just go here. So SNP AFF was used uh, plus um, the NCBI clinical significant uh, uh, tool for uh, finding out uh, which uh, um, potentially um, of these variants would have uh, impact because they are over, uh, you know, three, uh, 34,000 even more, yes, uh, variants. So you needed to, to filter really closely on 
where, where is significant and which uh, sequences could have an impact. So um, multiple tools were used, multiple sequence alignment, and then protein modeling and uh, identification of domains to see uh, and quantify what uh, impact uh, is uh, uh, on the functionality of protein. So to make story short, um, so we basically uh, further extended um, uh, knowledge regarding uh, genetic uh, sod polymorphism um, by exploring uh, genetic variation and how they could have uh, implication on functional uh, uh, domains. Uh, and we uh, identify seven very uh, likely harmful sod uh, variants. And that's basically it. Future studies are to come. Thank you very much. And just wanted to say um, that I'm editor uh, for this journal, Marine Drugs. So you are really welcome to uh, potentially uh, uh, submit your paper. So one of my papers was published there recently uh, on genome mining. So I think Alexi um, users could uh, look towards that in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, thanks, Nettie. We don't have time for no time for questions, but a great, great example of um, Galaxy success stories. Thank you. Last but not least, we're going to have a, a a change of a change of pace and move away from molecular biology towards ecology and hear about um, the Galaxy for Ecology and Galaxy E project. Uh, so I'm Mary uh, Jose from the National Center of uh, Scientific Research of France. So I will speak about uh, Galaxy uh, for Earth System and Biodiversity and uh, about the Ferris project on how, to, uh, how the project want to create an Earth Analytic Lab using uh, Galaxy. So first I will talk about Galaxy Ecology, how, is it, uh, how it's an inspiration for uh, the Galaxy Earth System. Then what is the Earth System model? And finally, uh, what's an Earth Analytic Lab? So Galaxy Ecology was uh, created in 2018 by the French Biodiversity Data Hub E Infrastructure. It's a transnational initiative for the analysis of biodiversity data in research and expertise. It's a, a European instance. So I will talk about uh, some of two of the of workflows that are already on Galaxy. And I will talk more about Galaxy Ecology tomorrow uh, during an update. So one of the workflow uh, on Galaxy uh, that was implemented last year is um, using satellite data to create biodiversity indicators. So you can download data from uh, the Copernicus or the European Spatial Agency or the TEA platform. And uh, from this Sentinel-2 data, you can process them and uh, have a raster build format that will can then that can be, then be used for uh, biodiversity to, to create biodiversity indicators. So you have different kinds of biodiversity indicators that you can uh, compute. Uh, the first one is the identification of biodiversity hotspots with uh, indicators such as Shannon, Simpson, and others. Uh, then once you have the hotspot, you can uh, do biodiversity indicators only for the canopy with alpha, beta, and functional um, analysis. So for instance, here you have a map of a alpha biodiversity indicators, and here a tabula of the breaker chest uh, table. Uh, then uh, you can also do a, um, an analysis on the spectral and not high spectral, on spectral indices that allow you to see the well-being of the vegetation. So for instance, you have the nominal different vegetation index or the canopy chlorophyll content index. So everything on this workflow that goes from the Sentinel-2 data to uh, biodiversity indicators uh, are explained on the Galaxy Training Network. Uh, so this NAIL workflow uh, is a first step toward uh, having um, an analysis on the earth critical zone, so the land degradation. Uh, another uh, set of tools that is available on Galaxy Ecology uh, is focused on the biodiversity of um, the ocean. So for that, uh, Ocean Biogeographic bio Information System, which is a global open access data and information clearing house on bi marine biodiversity for science, conservation, and sustainable development. 
so uh, in order to visualize the marine data, OBIS created the package OBIS indicators, which I used to create a uh, Galaxy tool that allows you to, to compute these five indicators. And so here you have an example of the output as a map for the channel index. So this set of tools um, allows you to have some information about the marine omics. So I'm speaking about land degradation and the marine omics because this, these are two topics of uh, the ferries um, earth system model. So the earth system models describe the atmospheric and oceanic uh, circulation and thermodynamics, the biological and chemical processes that pick back on the physics of climate and grid over the surface of the earth and underneath the surface of the oceans. So we have two main topics here, the earth critical zone with the land degradation uh, using Sentinel-2 data that we had that I explained just before and marinomics with uh, obese indicators. So these two topics are among the topics of ferries that, uh, that was designed to have an earth uh, system model. So we have five uh, main topics, ocean biogeochemical observations, then we have coastal water dynamics, uh, the Earth's critical zone, volcano space observatory, and marinomics observations. So these five uh, topics are for the ferries um, project, a, uh, an earth system, uh, creating an Earth system model. Uh, this project is a European open science cloud project. It's a new approach to observation and modeling of the Earth system, environment, and biodiversity. It aims at um, getting interdisciplinary data discovery and access service, and to create an Earth analytic lab and data lake. It's for policy makers, resource providers, so civil society, and general public, for scientific users, community, and operational forecast services. Um, so we will focus on the Earth Analytic Lab as uh, we want to try to create one with uh, Galaxy. So Earth Analytic, an Earth Analytic Lab is an easy way to visualize, analyze, and process environmental data on demand. So here, one of the solution is Galaxy. Uh, to um, the idea is to create a Galaxy instance with a set of tools for Earth system, environmental, and biodiversity data. So that way we can use multiple data sets to process them and chain them in one environment. So to do so, we were inspired by Galaxy Ecology and Galaxy Climate. Um, so uh, from the Galaxy Ecology uh, instance, we have uh, tools for accessing data. For instance, the occurrence tool from the G uh, occurrence tools that can retrieve data from GBIS or OBIS. We also have from the Galaxy Climate, the, Communist, the Copernicus Climate and Atmospheric Store tools that uh, allow you to retrieve data uh, on the climate. Uh, as I told you earlier, you have the biodiversity analysis tools that, uh, um, are, that we can rely on to um, start our work on different topics. So for instance, the Sentinel-2 for biodiversity. Uh, when uh, integrated, tools for uh, the Earth system. I um, use the Pangeo ecosystem tools with Jupyter notebooks and interactive tools as an inspiration. And finally, I uh, reuse all the Galaxy 20 networks that are available from these two instances. So uh, one of the main um, issue here is that we have multiple topics with multiple kind of data sets. So it's um, a, real, a real challenge. So Ferries wants to open gateways for the field of uh, earth and environmental sciences by addressing the limitations of the current digital architecture. So the questions that everybody is asking nowadays is where are the data, how to store them, how to access them, and is the data lake the mythical answer? So for now, we don't really have an answer to that, but we know what kind of data that we want. So. We have for the coastal water dynamic, the data on river discharge, meteorological and oceanographic condition, data from satellite sensors. For the earth critical zone, we also have satellite data such as uh, Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2. We need the data for the soil databases and national and regional earth critical zone data sets. Uh, for the volcano topics, we also need remote sensing and in-situ measurement and more 
But furthermore, we need access to the Copernicus uh, Sentinel Open Data Hub. And for the two other uh, topics, it's quite the same. We need in situ data, access to them, and uh, remote sensing data. For marinomics, however, we already have some of the tools uh, on Galaxy Ecology that we can use. For instance, uh, with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, so the occurrence tools that I talked about uh, earlier, uh, that uh, allow us to access data from, uh, from the GBIF. So uh, once we talk about uh, data access, we need to process this data. So for the coastal water dynamics workflow, the, it focuses on the coastal marine environment near est river estuaries. So it wants, the aim is to uh, follow the evolution of plankton blooms or the transfers and fate of, nutri of nutrients, carbon and contaminants. So here to um, create this uh, coastal water dynamic workflow, with the aim is to chain three tools using NetCDF files as inputs and outputs. So to do so, we have, we will have three uh, interactive tools. So we already want, have one, Divine that performs uh, n-dimensional variational analysis grouping of arbitrarily located ob observations. So this is a Jupyter notebook uh, tool that is already available on Galaxy um, Europe. Uh, so this tool allows the user to browse among all the notebooks available for this uh, for this kind of analysis and can input and output NetCDF files that can be then used in, for instance, Ocean Data View, which is a desktop interactive tool for exploration, analysis, and visualization of oceanographic and other georeference profile time series trajectory or sequence data. So uh, this uh, tool is also available on uh, Galaxy uh, Europe. And uh, then the final aim is to uh, chain these two tools with source, which, can, which will be a Jupyter notebook tool also that can calibrate and validate ocean model within a selected special domain using in-situ observations. So this is the workflow that we work to do on the most on and will soon be complete, I hope. Uh, then we have Earth critical zone aims. So the sustainable development goals created a target to combat desertification. From this target, uh, indicators to monitor the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area was uh, implemented. And from this indicator, three sub indicators were um, chosen, so the vegetation productivity, the land cover changes, and the soil organic carbon changes. So these three sub-indicators are uh, calculated by to the Trans Earth software, which processes raster data set and allows a pixel-based qualitative index of potential degradation. So this software is a QGIS plugin. I'm trying right now to um, take the script out, script out and create three different batch tools that uh, can uh, process uh, the data and have vegetation productivity and the three steps indicators. For now, I'm having Google access uh, issues with that. So if anyone has some idea about that, I'm all ears. Uh, for the volcano topics, they propose to join uh, and to make a joint analysis of heterogeneous remote sensing observation for the monitoring of global volcanic activity, allowing the focus on any major volcanic eruption worldwide. And for the final two topics, we have uh, biogeochemical that wants to provide a common platform to data scientists in order to qualify, calibrate, validate BGC data from sensors deployed on various platforms. So we want to use Galaxy for that. And finally, we have marinomics which uh, wants a platform that can provide the ability to analyze spatial and time comparable marine chemical metagenomics data sets for the exploration of biodiversity and its correlation with environmental quality. So for all these topics, there is multiple uh, data uh, set and uh, multiple uh, workflow that overlaps. And um, so we, aim, we want to reuse these different workflows and DEXTA in um, other uh, kind of uh, uh, 
process. <laughs> So uh, to do so, uh, we uh, have a collaboration with the project Euroscience Gateway. So the partners and the colleagues from Euroscience Gateway uh, came in France to make a two days uh, galaxy training where uh, they were helping uh, to teach the Ferris partner how to use and why use galaxy. We had the two day, uh, we had one day of uh, hands-on to integrate uh, tools with the attendant, we were able to integrate uh, five tools at the end. So two of the, these tools were uh, HDF Viewer and Scoop, which um, uh, the check the quality of uh, oceanographic uh, data. So the collaboration of the two EOSC projects uh, can get efficient um, cross-discipline workflow by creating, sharing, and reusing tools and workflows on Galaxy. Uh, and so this uh, collaboration is here to help us to integrate all of these Earth system topics on uh, Galaxy and create, we hope, at the end, uh, Earth system news galaxy.eu. Uh, thank you for in your attention. And if you have any advice, comments, and uh, other uh, remarks, I'm all ears. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. We have time for one question. Yeah. Bjorn. Great talk, Marie. Thanks a lot. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the problematic or maybe it's not problematic aspect that your tools are more or less running as either Jupyter notebooks, right? Or even desktop applications in the cloud. Is that, is that a specific and more complicated problem than just integrating Galaxy tools? So where do you see problems that we might or can help you to make that easier to run those yeah, VREs, virtual research environments for you? Um, right now for the tools that are already on Galaxy, I don't think there is any kind of troubles, but I think that some of the I say topics, but the partners of Ferries would like a persistent service where we don't have a tool that stops at one point and keeps running. So I don't know how to say that exactly, but uh, if Galaxy, if the aim is to use Galaxy also, it would be great to use Galaxy also as a service and not just as tools that will one day stop and we have to relaunch them and use them. So that's one part. And then we have, I think, a lot of tools that will be coming on Galaxy. And uh, some of them, uh, they are um, using multiple kind of language and the huge kind of data access. And that's some stuff that we will be needed help. I don't know if I'm really clear or not. <laughs> Great. Thanks again, Marie.